Good morning, good day, good evening, good night, whenever you are watching this video. So welcome to our second lecture on globalization, serving you from the University of the Bahamas Department of Sociology. As you can see on your screen, this is the Moodle page for our course, which again has all of the important documents, including our textbooks, Globalization, the Essentials by George Ritzer, and David Newman's book, that we use in our introductory sociology course, Soci 111. So we use three different chapters from that book. We use multiple parts from George Ritzer's The Essentials. This version looks a little bit different than the textbook that I have for you at no cost. You're welcome. Because the textbook in PDF form on our Moodle site is the first edition. This textbook is the second edition. We'll be using the first edition available for you for uh, exam and writing uh, assignment content. Available for you on Moodle right now is my introductory video, the glossary for Newman's chapters one and two, which is the end of chapter content for chapters one and two of Newman, but really it's just the content of chapter two. I decided to include the content for chapter one because it has three key terms that are necessary for understanding the disciplinary framework from which we're approaching this course, which is sociology. So if we dive into that material, first of all, you'll see the title of the book included in all three chapters, the detailed table of contents. I suggest looking at the table of contents because it gives you a good idea of the framework of information that you'll be looking into. So for example, the basic framework of chapter one, which again, you only have the end of chapter content on page 10 is the is sociology and the individual, the insights of sociology and the sociological imagination. Essentially what's going on is that in sociology, we are avoiding individualistic explanations. We want to rather focus on using our sociological imagination, which is what we use to look at the intersections of our personal lives with the broader social forces that set the contexts and situations within which we interact with other people. More broadly, those social forces can be thought of as social structures that are really kind of these social patterns that we see throughout all societies, historical periods, geographies. And at the micro level or the level of analysis closest to individuals, we see statuses and roles and groups and these are important aspects of social structure because oftentimes we engage in behaviors that are related to our social statuses. The behaviors that we engage in are roles. They're expected behaviors that are related to the positions that we have in society. And more specifically, those positions that we have in society are related to organizations and social institutions. So imagine, for instance, that you are a son or a daughter. Those are statuses that are related to your parents. And so your parents might have expectations for your behaviors or your roles as a son or a daughter. So your expected behaviors are your roles related to your statuses. Those statuses are related to social institutions. So think about the social institution of education, you being a student or a classmate, and the expectations or your roles are related to me or your other educators, teachers, professors, instructors, lecturers, whatever term you want to apply to our positions within the educational system. The specific organization related to education that brings us together in this relationship is the University of the Bahamas. So as it relates to religion, for example, the author of this textbook, David Newman, does a fairly decent job of providing a model or an example as it relates to social structure and the individual. Remember from the end of chapter content from chapter one that we're interested in using our sociological imagination rather than individualistic explanations. So the sociological imagination focuses our attention on broader social structural forces that set the context and provide the situations for our daily interactions. So look at this model, Exhibit 2.1. First of all, we have a broad social institution. In this case, it's religion, but you can think of all the other social institutions, family, education, politics, government, the state, the economy, markets. We can think of media, mass media, social media. We can think of 
military, science, sports, leisure, technology, communication, transportation, other social structural forces like race and gender. As these broadest aspects of social structure, the more macro level aspects of social structure like institutions, typically there are organizations within which we interact with members of our groups, depending upon the statuses that we hold within those institutions, organizations, and groups. That is the way that we apply our social structural thinking to utilize our sociological imagination. The flip side, as pointed out in chapter one, is individualistic thinking, which is perfectly fine if you want to use a psychological analysis of any given individual's behavior. You might get to know their personality, their thought patterns, their emotional intelligence, their intelligence quotient or IQ, their personal dispositions, taste preferences, goals, aspirations, trepidations, fears, anxieties, doubts, frustrations, their sense of uh, self-worth or self-esteem, their ability to control their impulse. All these psychological factors are perfectly fine. But the other side of that coin is the sociological imagination or the sociological perspective. And that focuses our attention on all of these situations that really don't depend upon unique and particular individuals with particular names and biographies and hopes and aspirations, dreams, goals, desires, personalities, because there are statuses that exist that individuals occupy. So statuses come first. You as a new human nascent individual born some 20, 40, 60 years ago, whatever your age might be, was born into a situation where you have a family. Now you're a son or a daughter, brother or sister, grandson, granddaughter, nephew, niece, cousin. Maybe your family introduces you to religion and now you're a Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, agnostic, polytheistic, and introduced to your local school system. And now you become a student, a classmate, and so on and so forth. So these positions in society already exist. And then new human beings are born into the world and begin to occupy those social positions along with which there are expectations. What do we call those expectations? Roles, that's right. So we carry out our roles within groups. Now that's a social structural way of thinking. Let's apply this though. So you decided to study sociology. So you open up a standard textbook like this, David Newman's sixth edition of Exploring the Architecture of Everyday Life, Sociology, the Brief Edition. You make your way through chapter one, which distinguishes between individualistic thinking and utilizing and developing our sociological imagination. You make your way to the second chapter. And like a lot of standard textbooks, especially social science and behavioral science textbooks, it opens up with a vignette. And what is David Newman going to have you read about? Why, what else? The genocide in Rwanda in 1994, in which 800,000 or so Tutsis were slaughtered, maimed, murdered by members of their community known as the Hutus. So who are these two groups and where do they come from? Do they arise naturally out of the earth and have a clear genetic, genealogical, separate lineage? Sociologically speaking, probably not. There's probably social forces, institutional and organizational forces behind the history of creating these in-groups and out-groups. More than that, as you read through this section, you'll discover that there are individuals who occupied certain status positions within government, within religion, within education, within social services, who utilize their organizational statuses and positions of authority within institutions to engage in mass murder or genocide. So that's employing our sociological imagination to a particular event that occurred across days and weeks and months. But if we broaden out our sociological imagination and we look to our course playlist, we can scroll down to a point in which I've curated videos on the topic of genocide. Genocide has occurred throughout societies, throughout history in many parts of the world. And therefore, when we think about something like genocide, we're not just thinking about the social structural forces that happen at the interpersonal level between individuals based upon their statuses and roles, but we can think about broader patterns in life, such as the genocides that occurred in communist and socialist countries like the USSR, China, Vietnam, Cambodia. 
And we can also think about genocides that occurred throughout Africa, throughout the Americas, and look at the broader structural forces. So if you're interested, you can look at these videos that I have on the genocide in Rwanda, but in particular, you can look at genocide as a world history, as the broader social forces and cultural patterns that underlie all of the different instances of genocide. So these are two different ways of looking at the same thing. One is a micro-level analysis in which we could take a look at a movie like Hotel Rwanda, which does a really good job of detailing what happened in particular events, in particular locations, in particular time periods, in particular geographies. Or we can broaden to a more macro level view in which we look at the pattern of all genocides. These are two different sociological ways of looking at the same thing, genocide. Now, if we open our main course textbook, Globalization, the Essentials, and we use a nifty little feature called Control F and look up the word genocide, we'll let the book search through and find the first instance in where that term is used on page 269. So this is an act committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So what are these groups? Are they natural? Are they something that is immutable? Or are they what we call socially constructed? Most social behavioral sciences will say that these groups are socially constructed. And we have a definite and specific term for that that depends upon social definitions. So you'll see that right on page 264, social definitions. How it is that we collectively define what we consider to be the demarcation between groups like the Hutus and the Tutsis, or like in the case of Nazi Germany, the Aryans, the blonde hair, blue eyed, quote unquote, perfect genetic uh, types of human beings versus all the rest, which led to the mass slaughter of multiple groups of people. We can look at racial and ethnic groups like Asians and Jews and Hindus and Americans and Caribbeans, Europeans, African Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, Caucasians, Latinos, Latinas, Hispanics, all these different racial and ethnic groups as socially constructed categories that rather than having like essential biological or scientific roots are really kind of the result of collective definitions of what we consider to be differences among human beings. This goes back to a classic statement in sociology known as the Thomas Theorem developed by W.I. and Dorothy Thomas in 1928, known as the definition of the situation. If men or people define situations as real, those situations become real in their consequences. It's a very important statement. That's at the top of page 265. So no matter if it's race or ethnicity, or if it's sex and gender, we have socially defined groups or categories of people that may or may not have some biological shared characteristics, physiological shared characteristics, but most definitely sociological shared characteristics. Racial and ethnic, sex and gender groups are categories of people that are basically social statuses. Now, what are considered to be the roles of those categories depends upon the prevailing cultural beliefs, values, and norms of a given society. Now, we might have values of pluralism or multiculturalism in more democratic Western societies in which we believe that people should cooperate or try to harmonize or at least tolerate differences. However, ideological constructs like racism, xenophobia, sexism, transphobia, homophobia develop and lead people to believe that there are natural or immutable hierarchies. And the importance of this lies in this word hegemonic. So you have hegemonic racist ideas or hegemonic masculinity or hegemonic nationality or nationalism known as jingoism. So the chauvinistic patriotism that people can have when they strongly support their nation, which they just happen to be born into due to their parents' copulation. So all of these in-group, out-group, tribalistic biases can lead people to situations in which genocide or ethnic cleansing occurs to the point where entire groups of people are attempted to be murdered or wiped off the face of the earth or expelled or forcibly removed from society. And when that happens, you can have patterns of large scale migration, people who are in the business of their self-interest, 
self-preservation. They don't want to die. They don't want to be killed. They don't want to be discriminated against. So they move about the world. And this is one, just one of the reasons why we see flows of people all around the world. And that is one cornerstone of globalization, the main topic of this course. So in my next video, we'll start to analyze and interrogate some definitions of globalization so that we can focus our attention more on what are the broader patterns of the unfolding of the development of a world society or a world community or a world culture, if that is the case. Some people argue against it, some people argue for it. And that's one of the issues that we'll attend to in this course is that there are different perspectives on what's happening, why, and what should happen in the future. So until then, thanks for listening.